He came right around here, walked up right behind me, and shot me right in the head. And then he turned, he hit her three times, and she died almost instantly. He kept trying to give me the gun, and I wouldn't. Then there was a knock on the door. My son-in-law busts the door wide open, knocks Danny aside, sees all the blood, sees the gun sitting on a coffee table. And he just looks at Heidi and says, do not come in here. Call 911. What's going on? I don't know what happened. I just came over to my parents' house because we were going to watch the game. And um, my mom is shot and my dad is shot and my brother's here. <laughs> Does anybody know what happened? Did, did your brother shoot your parents? I don't know. I think so. <laughs> on October 20th, 2007, Darkness engulfed the perfect family of Mark Petrick when he was brutally shot in his head in Wellington, Ohio. As he hit the ground, he saw his beloved wife lying next to him, robbed of her life. Desperate to fight for his life, Mark attempted everything he could in order to stay alive. When his daughter Heidi entered the house with her husband, she took one look at the horrifying scene in front of her and immediately dialed 911. Police rushed to the scene, and upon inspection, they found out that there was one lone shooter responsible for hunting down this couple. They wasted no time, and soon the chase began. Who was the shooter, and was he related to this family in any way? What was the motive behind such a gruesome act? Welcome back to M7 Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved, and twisted cases from around the world. Mark and Susan Petrick, a loving couple, married for 23 years with three lovely children, two daughters, Heidi and Holly, and a son, Daniel Petrick. Mark was a Pentecostal minister at New Life Assembly of God in Wellington. Susan was born in Cheverly, Maryland, and while attending Valley Forge Christian College, she met Mark and decided to tie the knot with him. Her three children were raised in a Christian household, and they loved and respected their parents, and were a happy and peaceful family of five in the village of Wellington. All of them had a soft spot for their youngest family member, Daniel. Popularly known as Danny, he was 16 years old and attended Wellington High School. He was a cheerful and friendly teenager who loved his family. He also loved to read the Bible. He was an average school at student with no record of suspension and achieved average to good marks. Daniel, however, was really passionate about football. But things were about to change for this little happy family, and one fine day, everything went down the drain. October 20th, 2007 started as a normal day for the Petrick family. They had a merry morning, and their oldest daughter, Heidi, was planning to visit them later in the evening with her husband, and the family was planning to watch a baseball game together. At around 7 p.m., Daniel came downstairs, looking extremely cheerful. He walked up towards his parents and spoke excitedly. Hey, Mom and Dad, I have a surprise for you. Will you close your eyes? And I glanced over at Sue, and I was like, okay, I mean, cool. We thought maybe he was going to be showing us something or apologizing about all the video game tension. Filled with anticipation, both of his parents agreed to close their eyes as they waited. After a while, Mark heard a click. But before Mark could react, Daniel had grabbed the family gun from his father's locker and pulled the trigger. The bullet hit right in Mark's head, point blank. Feeling numb, he fell onto the ground as he watched Daniel shoot his wife, Susan, three times, first in her chest and then on her right arm before landing the last bullet in her head. Susan died almost immediately. And once the deed was done, Daniel walked up to his father and made him hold the gun. He told Mark that he should hold onto the gun since it was his, but Mark didn't play along with him anymore. As Mark lay struggling on the ground, a knock was heard on the front door. Heidi, who was planning to come much later in the evening, had arrived with her husband. Panic started to sink into Daniel as he rushed towards the front door. He opened the door, and when his sister asked if she could come in, he replied, You shouldn't come in. Mom and Dad had a huge argument. Heidi could hear faint moaning sounds coming from the living room, and when she listened carefully, she heard his father calling out for help. This made her push past Daniel to enter the house where the horrifying scenes greeted her. 
Daniel had gotten a hold of the gun again, but Heidi's husband, Andrew Archer, immediately realized what he was planning and yanked the gun away forcefully from the teenager. Now with the weapon gone, Daniel wasted no time and immediately fled in his family van, but not before picking up his copy of Halo 3. Before Heidi could ask any questions, Daniel had fled. She immediately dialed 911 as she held her breath. What's going on? I don't know what happened. I just came over to my parents' house because we were going to watch the game. And um, my mom is shot and my dad is shot and my brother's here. <laughs> Does anybody know what happened? Did, did your brother shoot your parents? I don't know. I think so. <laughs> As police started to spread around in hopes of catching the teenager, it didn't take them long to capture Daniel, who was driving to his friend's place to play Halo 3. Why would my dad shoot my mom? I, I don't know, man. Now, with him in police custody, Daniel was taken into the interrogation room where the detectives decided to question him regarding the events that occurred that evening. While Daniel sat inside the interrogation room, away from the comforts of his home, he started to get agitated as he fidgeted around. When the detectives came to question him, however, Daniel showed no sign of hesitation as he fabricated a story about what exactly happened that evening, trying to blame the whole thing on his father. Take me through today everything that was going on. I was sitting in my room, and then my dad was just yelling, just screaming at my mom. My dad walk into his bedroom and then walk back out and then I heard a gunshot. I ran out there and my mom had been shot. <laughs> he pointed the gun at me and then he said he was sorry and then he shot himself. As time passed by and the detectives kept on pressuring him to give them more details, reality started to sink in for Daniel as he started to get nervous. It didn't take the detectives long enough to make Daniel confess everything truthfully since the pressure of the interrogation had already started to disturb the young boy. He confessed to the shooting and killing his own mother because they weren't allowing him to play his game Halo 3. This baffled the police officers as they stared at the teen boy sitting in front of them. Upon questioning him again, Daniel started to narrate his story of when he was first introduced to Halo 3 and how the game eventually led him to sit in the interrogation room for shooting his own parents. What must have gone down that drove Daniel to murder his own mother in cold blood while also trying to kill his father by shooting him point-blank in the head? Upon further investigation and questioning, the police started to uncover a number of events from the past that finally led to this horrific outcome. It was the year 2007 when darkness engulfed the Petrick family for the first time. Daniel had contracted a staphylococcus infection from a skiing injury. He was completely bedridden and at the mercy of his parents who didn't compromise to his well-being and fast recovery. Being housebound for a year due to severe spinal damage, Daniel couldn't play football with his friends anymore and had to seek refuge in different forms of leisure, such as the television and video games. His father gifted him an Xbox, and Daniel entered the world of video games. His parents never restricted his playtime, but being a man of God, Mark didn't tolerate the games that involved violence, and that was exactly where Daniel's field of interest was slowly heading. Soon, his obsession started to grow for the new game called Halo 3. In the year 2007, the Halo 3 game had been launched. Halo 3 was a first-person shooter video game developed by Bungie for the Xbox 360 console. The game was based on an interstellar war between the 26th century humanity involving soldiers and aliens. When the game was first released, it attracted a lot of people and started building a loyal fanbase. Soon, Halo 3 became the largest selling video game in 2007. Fancied by this new game, Daniel wanted to buy a copy of the game, but Mark immediately said no. This, however, didn't stop Daniel, as he snuck out of his window, having decided to purchase a copy of Halo 3. Slowly, his gaming habit started to get worse when it was left unchecked by his father. At times, Daniel would end up playing for eight hours a day, and when he couldn't get a chance to play at his house, 
he'd simply go over to his friend's place to continue it there. When his father, Mark, learned that his son was playing a shooting game for hours without stopping, he decided to ban him from playing Halo 3 in the house. But nothing could stop Daniel from playing his favorite game. He'd often steal his copy of Halo 3 to play with his friends. This infuriated Mark, and tension started to stir up inside the four walls of the Petrick house. Mark, like most parents back in 2007, was quite skeptical of this new form of game. He thought that playing such violent games affects the mental health and psyche of an individual. Thus, holding on to his Christian beliefs, Mark gave Daniel an ultimatum that either he stopped playing the game or he moved out of the house. We had video games in our home. Danny and I played Madden football all the time. We did the racing games, motocross, all those type of games, sports games, and we had no problem. We had a lot of fun with them. He would just play for hours and hours and hours, three days straight, and only taking a bathroom break and eating a bowl of cereal, no sleep. He changed significantly. He was very outgoing, very fun-loving, very goofy kid, and he became very secluded. I don't care what the game is. If all you're doing is pointing a gun at people and killing them, these games are not acceptable for children. We would not allow them for any reason whatsoever in our home. Daniel chose the latter. He went over to stay at his friend's place, and the two of them would play games for 18 hours a day, which showcased his obsession. When Daniel's friend's parents realized that he had no plans to leave and kept playing video games, they grew concerned. As a result, they ended up calling Daniel's parents. This was bad news for Daniel because now he had to head back home where he wasn't allowed to play his game anymore. When Daniel returned back home, his game was immediately confiscated. This led to a huge argument between Daniel and his parents. Mark, however, stood true to his words and proceeded to keep the copy of the Halo 3 in the family's safe locker along with his Taurus P92 handgun, which were inaccessible without the key that Mark made sure to hide perfectly. Mark was certain that this step would help his son to finally move on, since Daniel didn't have access to the family locker. But his hopes of seeing his son change shattered in the most unfathomable way when on October 20th, 2007, Daniel decided to shoot both of his parents, killing his mother in the process. He, however, did not forget to grab his copy of Halo 3 before running out of the house when his sister decided to call the police on him. The police chase ended quite immediately, since Daniel was only driving to his friend's house to play games together after murdering his own mother and was captured by the officers. He was brought to the police station for questioning, and even though at first he tried to cook up stories in order to escape, he, however, soon confessed to the whole crime because of the pressure he felt while sitting in the interrogation room. Thus, Daniel's confession gave the officers enough evidence to file a case against him. Back at the Petrick household, Mark was hospitalized, after which he had to undergo five surgeries that included reconstruction surgeries for his eye socket and his jaw. The pain, both physical and mental, made Mark slip into a coma. I was in the hospital for, I think, 30 days. They did five surgeries on me reconstruction surgeries to my eye socket, the roof of my mouth, my jaw, just all kinds of stuff. I couldn't stop thinking about what happened that night. And the more I thought about it, the more I wanted to kill him. This made him miss his wife's funeral as he was busy fighting for his life in the hospital. Miraculously, Mark was able to survive even after the severe hit he received in his head. When he finally gained consciousness after two weeks of being in the coma, he had to learn all his bodily functions again due to severe damage in his brain. During this process, however, Mark was undergoing a much bigger struggle. The pain and anger of watching his beloved son shoot his wife and himself over trivial things such as a video game that resulted in his wife's death. I said, God, I, I hate that kid. I hate him. He's my son, but I hate him. And so I told God, you know what? The next time I see him, I'm going to kill him. Mark was enraged, and he knew he couldn't forgive his son for what he did to him, and most importantly, his wife. But being a parent, a father, sometimes the power of love overweighs the sense of justice, and this happened with Mark as well. As the trial for Daniel was about to begin, Mark knew that even though he wanted his wife to get justice, he couldn't send his son to jail. Being a man of God and staying true to his Christian beliefs, 
Mark knew that there was nothing bigger than forgiveness itself, and he was ready to pardon his son for his despicable act. Slowly but surely, Daniel's sisters also forgave Daniel for stealing their mother away from them. Daniel's trial was held from December 15th to 17th, 2008, at the Lorraine County Court of Common Pleas in Elyria, Ohio, where James Burge was the presiding judge. The trial of Daniel Petrick was a really emotional one. Daniel had shown remorse and accountability for the crime that he'd committed. He was seen crying throughout the trial and kept glancing at his father from time to time. When Mark came up to speak, it was another wave of emotion-filled statements that were delivered to the court. What's written in this letter is not only my views, but the views of my entire family. I write this letter on behalf of my son, Daniel Petrick. Danny has had to face and is now facing the very serious consequences of what he did on October 20th, 2007. I know, without any doubt, he has severe regret, remorse, and guilt for what he did to his mom and I that evening. I can't count the number of times he has told me that he's so sorry for what he did and he'll never be able to forgive himself. I can also count the number of times he has told me that he's so happy that I survived and so glad to still be able to see me. He's told me that numerous times. I love you, Danny. I can't count the number of times that he said, Dad, I miss Mom. I miss Mom. His pain runs very deep, and it should. I believe, I believe it should run deep. And if his, if his pain did not run deep, I guarantee you I would not be standing here speaking on his behalf. I call him like I see him. And I would not stand here and talk on his behalf if his pain didn't run deep. I know it does, contrary to others' opinions. In addition to that, about 25 people came out in support of Daniel at the trial, which included his friends and relatives, as well as his immediate family, such as his grandfather. Despite all this, however, Daniel Petrick was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 23 years, which was the minimum sentence. The maximum sentence Petrick faced was life in prison without parole, recommended by the prosecuting attorney, Anthony Sillo. Petrick was convicted for aggravated murder, attempted aggravated murder, and tampering with evidence. Daniel couldn't be given the death penalty due to his age. When the judge gave his statement, however, many fingers were raised. In this particular case, not so much the violence of the game, because I believe in the Halo 3, what it amounts to is uh, a contest to see who can shoot the most aliens who attack. It's my firm belief that after a while, the same physiological responses occur that occur in the ingestion of some drugs. And I believe that an addiction to these games can do the same thing. The dopamine surge, the stimulation of the nucleus accumbens, the same as in addiction, such that when you stop, your brain won't stand for it. The other dangerous thing about these games, in my opinion, is that when these changes occur, they occur in an environment that is delusional. Because you can shoot these aliens, and they're there again the next day. You have to shoot them again. And I firmly believe that Daniel Petrick had no idea at the time he hatched this plot, that if he killed his parents, they would be dead forever. But I believe there's hope here. I believe that uh, it will start here. And uh, at some point when all is known, 
about Daniel and what occurred here, we will be able to achieve a greater sense of justice. These sentences by the judge didn't age well, since the statements given by him had no medical or psychological proof. Moreover, no studies mention that playing shooting games would generate murderous thoughts in children. Daniel is currently serving a sentence at Grafton Correctional Institution and will be eligible for parole in 2030. Seeing his son being convicted of murder was really hard on Mark and his two daughters, but losing his wife to the hands of his own son should haunt him till this day. And even though Mark had found a new love, Susan would always stay dear to his heart. The Petrick family yearned that their youngest family member of their family, Daniel Petrick, could hopefully get a second chance in life someday. Everyone had forgiven Daniel and just hoped that he keeps all right while he serves his sentence. This crime committed by Daniel had broken everyone greatly, but no one was as affected as Mark as he stood between the line of justice and fatherly love. His love for his son in the end made him stand for his son in court, and he always misses his little boy. Today's case was truly a heartbreaking one. Daniel committed this act in the heat of the moment. Had he taken a step back and decided to just talk things out with his parents, the outcome would have been much different. So, before we leave you, do you think Halo 3 had affected Daniel's psyche and was the reason behind him committing this heinous act? Or do you think that Daniel already had aggressive violent behavior that was just lying dormant for so long? Let us know in the comment section below. And if you found today's video interesting, please consider subscribing to our channel, hit that like button, and sharing our videos. Also, if you have any crime story that you'd like us to cover, leave us a message in the comment section below. Until the next time we bring more chilling and spine-tingling cases for you, stay safe.